Good evening and welcome to our program. I'm Stan Adams with the Word and Sword TV broadcast. Been coming to you now for over 35 years and uh, we're glad to be in your home tonight. And uh, I've been with the program about eight years now, so we're looking forward to uh, studying God's Word together tonight with you. And if you have your Bibles, make sure that you get them out and uh, check what I'm saying because as always, any man can be wrong. I can misquote a passage. I can uh, have the wrong idea about a passage. I can get confused and uh, present something that's not really in the text. So you need to check me out, make sure that I'm teaching God's Word. And if I'm not, you'd be our friend to call us and let us know that. The number is 828-485-5555 and this is a live program. Now, I want to assure you that uh, if you call, you will get through. So. Uh, we have two operators that are standing by right now. If you have a Bible question, you want to call in and have us deal with that as the program progresses tonight, uh, that would be just fine if you wanted to do that. And they'll, if you don't want to come on the air, that's, uh, that's fine. They are also not only operators, but also screeners. And so uh, we want to make sure that everybody's going to be uh, behave like they need to be. And uh, we try to be courteous with the people that we talk to in our, in our presentations, and we want you to be the same way. So uh, understood, I think that's understood. Uh, to those of you that have been watching the program for years, uh, a special welcome to you. We appreciate so much your uh, faithfulness to watching the program and to calling in with comments and also for uh, even seeing us out in the public from time to time and saying something to us about the program. And again, we solicit comments that are both pro and con. If we are not doing what we should in presenting God's Word uh, as, it, as it is written, you please let us know, because we can be lost for that. Uh, I can per personally be in jeopardy with my soul if I don't teach you the things that are found in God's, God's Word. I will not tell you, I can't tell you that I will promise that I will tell you everything that might please you, but I will give you book, chapter, and verse for what we say. So, and the operators will do the same if you have a question. If you have a, a request for a particular subject, we have several Bible tracts that are available, or we could print off a sermon for you uh, on, on that subject. So you just call in with your question tonight, if you have one that's a Bible question. Well, before we get into our, the meat of our program tonight, we have two questions we'll be talking about that were left hanging last week, called in late with uh, later on the program with the questions. And so as we do, we are going to start off this program by answering those questions. So hopefully the caller from last week is available. We told him we would be talking about these questions. And so hope you're there and that you will benefit from this. If not, uh, we will make sure that you uh, know that the program is available and you can call for it or you can uh, go to our website at www.wordandsword.com and you can get a copy of it. So uh, any copy, in any program that we've had, you can go to uh, www.wordandsword.com and get a number of, a lot of information on that website. So uh, go, go access that if you will. We have two correspondence courses where you can study the Bible at your leisure. I got a call today from a man, or a message today from a man in England that's using uh, the, the Bible correspondence course now, asked if he could do that, and using that over in England, in London. And uh, of course we told him certainly, and uh, so he said he's gotten several uh, helpful things off of our website, and he's not the only one. There have been several people that have been able to do that, and they've called and told us about that. But it's always good to know that the, pro the material on the program is, first of all, biblical, and that it's a, something that others can use. And so uh, there is no copyright on anything we have, nor is there any claim to originality on anything that we present. So uh, you go ahead and do that, but d uh, just be careful that if you, if you are going to teach it, that you don't change it. <clears throat> So, um, unless it's un, it's un, unless it is unscriptural, and then you would need to tell us so we don't have something out there that's unscriptural. So you can call in tonight, ask for a copy of this presentation, a free, a free Bible correspondence course, or a tract. If you need, if you're one of those people that doesn't have GPS and you like to operate by maps, you can call for a map of the building. 
uh, how to get to the building and also we put out a monthly bulletin that we mail out quarterly. Uh, the word and so are the beacon is the name of our bulletin. And again, uh, call in tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking about two or three subjects tonight. One of them is withdrawal of fellowship. And one of them is all about what the Bible says about Christmas and holidays, but particularly Christmas. And those are questions that have been asked recently. And so we're going to give a little more time to those. Having a had a listener in Lincolnton a few weeks ago that had questions about Christmas and what does the Bible say about that? And uh, so we are certainly going to uh, give information on that. Also, if you will, uh, remember that we do have a uh, Facebook account and we're having some technical difficulties here um, on advancing our slide here, but we do have a Twitter account and a Facebook account, two, two Facebook accounts. So. If you would like to leave a message or a post up on those, those particular venues, you can certainly do that by going to www.wordandsword.com slash wordandsword and www.facebook.com slash Newton, North Carolina Church of Christ and notice the differences in the case situations there on North Carolina being capitalized and Newton being capitalized and Christ being capitalized. And then follow us on Twitter. Leave a post there if you would like to, and we will certainly study the Bible with anyone who is concerned. And if you don't do any of those, if you just want us to come into your home or you want to meet us somewhere in a venue where we can study the Bible together for a while, you let us know. We are all about studying the Bible with one another. Uh, tonight's number again is 828-485-5555. And the first question we'll be dealing with tonight is why we believe the Bible teaches that the church needs to withdraw from unfaithful members. So we'll be talking about that in just a moment. But before we do that, we're going to deal with the two questions that were, and by the way, this is one of the questions that was asked. So uh, we're going to uh, give a short answer here on withdrawal of fellowship. And then we're also going to deal with 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, let's work with 1 Corinthians chapter 6 first. And the question was posed this way. Uh, what does the Bible say about two brethren going to court with one another? Uh, and we're talking about two members of the church, the Lord's church, going and doing that. Um, of course, the ideal thing, and even the court system tells you this today, the ideal thing for any person who has a conflict of any kind, be it civil or be it criminal or whatever it might be, uh, the ideal thing is to try to work it out before you have to go to court and get that taken care of. Most, most uh, There's a whole group of people now that are called arbitrators that a lot of, of uh, judges will use in the legal system to try to circumvent the loaded court docket, getting more and more loaded. So. Um, like, for instance, in marital issues with uh, uh, divorce pending and things like that, the judge will order both people to go to an arbitrator and talk about it. In the disposition of inheritances, things along those lines, arbitrators are used very freely. And that's in keeping with what God's Word does teach. But the only passage that actually deals with this that is not an Old Testament passage, we, are, we are live under the New Testament, is 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And notice this in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, verse 1. He says there, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust, and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world be, uh, be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge in the smallest of matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels, how much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother is going to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is an utter, utterly a fault among you, because you go to law, to law with one another. Why do you not rather just take a wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourself to be defrauded? No, you do wrong, and you defraud, and that's your brethren. 
Know ye not that un the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, neither fornicators, or idolaters, nor adulterers, or effeminate, nor, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, or thieves, or covetous, or drunkards, or revilers, or extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of God. All things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. So what you have at Corinth, this is a church of Christians, saved, saved people by the blood of Jesus Christ, baptized believers in the body of Christ, and they are having some conflicts of some sort. And rather than just suffer themselves to be defrauded uh, on those things, uh, they are wanting to press their points. Well, if they go to that point, then there should be those in the congregation that are able to arbitrate before them and, and settle this so you don't have to go before the, the courts of the land. But here you have a disregard for what your example is to others. Remember that as Abraham said to Lot, we be brethren. And there is no reason for us to get into a conflict over who has the best land. He got, Abraham gave Lot the best choice. There was quarreling among the, the people of, uh, that, that were with Lot and the people that were with Abraham, the herdsmen. And so they said, there's no reason for us to have a problem like this. We're brethren. And so Abraham said, you just choose whatever you want. Well, Lot chose the best property, the best piece of property. Abraham just let him do it, no problem. And he went on his way. Both of them prospered. And there was never any type of problem ever after that on that issue. Well, in the same way, there are some issues that you need to settle with yourselves. There are some legal issues, however, that in our society only the courts of the land can settle. For instance, child custodies, things along those lines. Um, those are things that if a person doesn't leave a will and they die and then they have children and the children don't die, sometimes a scenario may come up that the children may be left and the people at church are the only ones to care for them. Well, there has to be some legal procedures going through for that. That's not against God's Word. That's just using the legal system uh, that God put in place, the courts that be and the powers that be are ordained of God. He put them in, in place. And governments are ordained of God. So we can use the government for certain things. Now, to those that are out in the world, a person that is not a New Testament Christian, and they come and they try to defraud a, a Christian, there is a point at which the Christian just says, okay, but we cannot and we dare not, Ephesians 5.11, have fellowship with darkness. We can't do that. Nor should we bid God speed, 2 John 11, to those who are participants in darkness. And that would stand true certainly in the church, but also to some degree in the world. That we don't endorse any type of misbehavior, any type of sin. And we can't just let it go unchecked from time to time. Now, after you have exhausted all possibilities, uh, there's nothing you can do uh, else you can do, then you just have to sit back and say, okay, well, I did what I could and I'm gonna not let it bother me anymore, I'm gonna move on. And the person will have to answer for what they've done. But going to court, brother to brother, going to court in the court systems uh, is not something we should do. Um, and also calling the law on somebody without any type of warning whatsoever. And I think the, the caller that called last week, uh, that was along the lines of what had happened, uh, the scenario they gave. I don't know the details of what happened, but if what happened was a person just went straight to the law without trying to reconcile anything themselves, then that would have been an issue. But had there, if there were efforts made to try to reconcile and the person would not do that and they were perhaps a danger to the whole assembly or perceived to be, well, that would be a judgment call about whether somebody needs to be removed from the premises or not. Uh, and I don't know the details, so I can't speak directly to that. But I do know that if the church in this day and time does feel threatened uh, by anyone who comes into the assembly, there is nothing wrong 
with the uh, congregation utilizing the police to come and to circumvent a potential issue. You know, we live in a dangerous world today. And we live in a world that is very risky, even in the church. Just what I'm doing here on this program could potentially be a risk, not only to the program, to the station here, but also to me and to the congregation. So you have to be careful. And you have to recognize that the laws and the powers that be are ordained of God. They are put there for a purpose and they can be utilized without any violation of God's will. But the idea that two brethren who have a quarrel or have an issue want to go and, and expose it to the entire community is something that Paul is saying here, there is no way, that is ungodly behavior. And you ought not to ever involve yourself with that. You need to talk to wise people in the church and let them arbitrate and listen to them and go by what they say and leave it there. That is what God would require of his people that that be done. Now, the question that the caller had last week about withdrawal of fellowship is going to be addressed in detail tonight. The Bible does talk about that. And with that in mind, to begin our lesson tonight, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 18. You have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 18. And this perhaps is the first mention that we have here in, uh, in, the, in the church of being talked about, about uh, situations that would come up uh, that would need to be taken care of among brethren and, and uh, that there would come a time where the church would have to speak and would have to separate from those that were walking ungodly. In verse 15 of Matthew chapter 18, and again this starts off as an issue that is between two brethren. Well, what is the, what is the remedy here? The two brethren work out the private issues, what happens? But look, if you will, at Matthew 18, 15. If thy brother shall trespass against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. All right, so what's the scenario? If somebody has a grievance against another, they talk it over one to one and try to work it out. If he hears you, Matthew 18, 15, you've gained your brother, and that's wonderful. The situation's taken care of, it's over, and everybody's fine, and uh, everybody's serving the Lord like they should now, and uh, the problem is handled. But notice if it's not handled, but if he will not hear you, then take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word shall be established. Now remember, this hasn't come before the church yet. It's still in a private mode. One person to one person, and then two, two or three witnesses are brought in to make sure that, the, that whatever they can do to help, they will. And it gets a hearing, and either side could be prejudiced. All right, now you always have problems come up in the church when this type of order is violated. When you jump to two or three witnesses and don't go through one-on-one, -on -one, what you've done is open the door for potential problems and open the door for information that should be private becoming public. And when that happens, then you have all types of potential for gossip and for things along those lines to take place. Remember, this is supposed to be a matter between two brethren. It's not a doctrinal matter at this point, but it can become one, all right? And I don't get the idea here that this is just a grievance that somebody might have, although it could include that. But notice what happens after this. If the matter is not settled between the two or three uh, witnesses and the two people involved, so you've got at most five people that are involved here. And if they will not hear you on these things or take the advice of others, again, I believe a sin issue is primarily involved here. If they will not hear you, uh, if they neglect to hear all of them, then tell it to the church. The reason I think it's a, it's a doctrinal issue or a sin, a sin issue is because that you don't withdraw from somebody from something that's not sin, and you will see that in a minute. But if he neglects to hear the church, 
then let him be unto you as a heathen man and as a publican. All right? So here's a situation where something should have stayed private. It didn't. The two, the two people couldn't work it out. They bring in three more people, and that doesn't work. So they bring it before the church, and the church hears it and tries to reconcile them. And they will not. One or both of them will not relent from their sins. So if that's the case, the instruction is, if it gets to this point, that the church is to act. And notice what it says here. If they neglect to hear the church, let them be unto thee as a heathen and a publican. Now, Jesus is talking to Jewish people. The Jews would go around the corner if a publican walked by. All right? Publicans were not respected at all. They were outsiders. They were people that worked for both Rome, who were native Jews, and the Jews didn't like them a bit. They collected taxes for Rome. And a heathen was a Gentile. And it didn't matter who they were or what, how good a person they were. If you were a Gentile, you were a heathen. And he, said, he uses those terms. So here's a brother in Christ that can take on the status of becoming a heathen or a publican, one who is cast to the side, one who is put out of the fold. Well, a, a disobedient child of God. They don't cease to be a child of God. They just cease to be a child of God in favor with the shepherd. They are a wayward sheep. They have gone astray. And what are we supposed to do if that situation takes place? Well, what's the purpose for putting them outside so that there is an identity of where they are and who they are and that they are not a part of the fold? I don't know how you are, but a lot of, I hear an awful lot when I ask people to come to church services with us at Newton or anywhere where I've been. I have an awful lot of problems sometimes with people, and you probably have the same issue. What is the biggest excuse people give for not wanting to come to a formal church service? What do you hear? Well, let me run this by you and see if it sounds familiar. Well, I wouldn't go down there. There's too many hypocrites. Well, you know what? That, if that's true, that you have hypocrisy in the church that goes uncorrected, those people are going to be lost too. And what I tell people is if we have hypocrites in the church, come help us to identify them. Because right now we don't know who they are. So come help us identify them and we'll take care of that. The, dan the danger that a hypocrite can do to the church is unbelievable. Okay? And Satan knows that. So he says here there does not need to be hypocrisy in the church. Now remember that those in the body of Christ are the redeemed of God. These are the people that are Christians. They are followers of Jesus Christ. And if a person is not following Jesus Christ, but is allowed to continue as if they are, and as if nothing's wrong, then you are, you're doing your, the church a disservice, and you're doing the person a disservice by allowing them to think that they can operate on their own rules and override Christ's rules and be just fine. There needs to be a clear distinction. And if a person is in fellowship with God and will not correct themselves like they should, they draw out of fellowship with the Lord. Imagine if you will, we have a, we have a, a little triangle and it points up to heaven, <clears throat> points up. Well, what you have there, our fellowship spiritually, is first of all with God, okay? Now, if my fellowship with God breaks down, okay, and I am out of fellowship with God, then what must also need to happen according to the Scriptures? We'll talk more about this. Then my fellowship with my brothers and sisters in Christ is severed too, because here are those that are trying to walk properly, and here's people that are not trying, that, are, that don't care. All right, now, <clears throat> there's going to be a distinction there. Some have said, I will walk with the Lord, and some have said, I'll walk with Him to a point, but not all the way. Well, that's hypocrisy. 
The one that walks wayward from their service to God has severed their fellowship with the Lord. So the faithful are told to set that person outside, to withdraw and turn their back basically upon that person, but not for the purpose of being mean to them, not for the purpose of being better than them or holier than thou in our attitudes, but for the purpose of letting them think about you, um, where they are and what's happened. A, a common form of discipline that I wish my parents had known more about uh, is a timeout chair. Are you familiar with that? Do you have any children that you say, okay, you won't, be, you won't listen to me, so you go take a timeout. Now, in my generation, that was called go stand in the corner. But we're told today that that bothers kids' psyche, so we don't stand in the corner today, but you can time out. You can do that. And that's a common form of discipline. But what is the purpose of a time out? Purpose of it is to let the child stand there and think about what they've done. And also, it's to separate them from the crowd so that they don't influence that crowd in the wrong way anymore. I know sometimes when uh, kids would have to sit in the corner, and believe it or not, back then you'd get a dunce cap sometimes too. So uh, that was humiliating. Well, do you know the scriptures teach that the person that has, with, that has walked away from God is to learn to be ashamed about it? Because their boldness has reached a point in their spiritual life to where they don't care anymore. So when someone doesn't seem to care about misbehavior anymore, then you have to get them to thinking about it again. And certainly the Lord's plan for discipline is a plan that works. Now, does it always result in a person coming back? No. But neither did the death of Ananias and Sapphira back in the, in the early church. When you had them, they had lied to the Holy Spirit. And the first case actually of withdrawal of fellowship or discipline in the church, New Testament church, was the death penalty. Now, it's not that way today, but it is certainly stipulated in the scriptures as to what behavior we're supposed to have if we're faithful brethren toward those who are unfaithful. And by unfaithful, we're talking about not of walking according to the, to the conditions of God's will. Going your own way, charting your own course, that's rebellion. And rebellion, in the Old Testament, it says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. We can't just rebel against God and do what we want to. And also, we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians 5 next, if you have your Bibles. Just turn over to 1 Corinthians 5, and we're going to see what language is used there. Now, at, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you have a brother who is in the church at Corinth. He is a Christian, and he's not behaving like a Christian. As a matter of fact, his sin is so bizarre that not even the moralist people of Corinth would even mention it. It's not even mentioned as bad as it is. The man is married to his father's wife. Okay? Now, it is reported, chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, if you have your Bibles, get one out, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it's reported commonly that there's fornication among you. And such fornication is, is not so much as named among the Gentiles. All right? That one should have his father's wife. And then look at the reaction of the brethren. Now, the Corinthian church in this matter was hypocritical. And they would be open to the charges of being a church full of hypocrites. He says in verse 2, you're puffed up. And you've not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from you. Now, what's that mean? Are you supposed to pray for his death? No. You're supposed to pray for him to be separated from you so that he can turn back to the Lord and repent. So his soul will be saved. He says in verse 3, I'm not there in body, but I am in spirit, and I have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has done such a thing. In the name of Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus, deliver such a one, watch this language, unto Satan, for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit might be saved 
in the day of the Lord. Now, again, you don't deliver him to Satan so that he'll get killed. That's not what it is. The man is walking a carnal or fleshly lifestyle. He is consumed with sin and thinks it's okay. And the brethren at Corinth are endorsing that by not doing anything about it. Someone says, well, they didn't, they didn't, they weren't involved in fornication, all them. Yeah, but they were bidding God speed to a man who was. Second John 11 says you can't do that. So they were not doing anything and that was the problem. And they are told to deliver this man unto Satan so that the fleshly desires, those that a desire to serve the carnal may be driven out, may be uh, overridden by the power of the Word. Now again, let's stress the point that God has a plan for every aspect of man's life. He's got a plan for salvation. He's got a plan in the church for the activity and the organization of the church. And He has a plan for when things go haywire. And Christians begin to act like the world. You do not act like that's okay because they're Christians. No. As a matter of fact, they walk to a higher standard, we'll see in 1 Corinthians 5. He goes on, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. You don't want this man to be lost. And in essence, what Paul is telling them here is you, you don't love this man like you should, because you haven't spoken against his sin. Now that seems contrary, doesn't it? Doesn't it seem like, and here's, here's the scenario today of what Dr. Phil might say or what some person that's in the world or the psychologist might tell us today. Well, let's don't damage this person. Let's be nice and let's just, uh, let's just gather around them and love them. Well, that's not what he says here. He says love them, but there is an expression of love that in our society is deemed as something that is absolutely horrible to do. That you would want somebody to be ashamed of their actions. We live in a society today that says, don't shame anybody. Don't allow them to feel negative about their behavior. Well, let me ask you something. Isn't that exactly what happens to a person when they get arrested? It is. If you allow your children to run rampant and do whatever they please in your house and at school, then they're going to get arrested and be put in jail. You talk about a humiliating experience. So before they get to that point, what do you need to do? You need to discipline them. In a loving way, certainly, but in a stern way, and let them feel the consequences of their actions. When someone in the body of Christ, in this case in 1 Corinthians 5, is committing fornication and is doing so with the approval and the license of the brethren. There's something seriously wrong in the church. The brethren don't need to ever love somebody so much that they will not discipline. Now we have a lot of people today that don't believe in discipline of any kind. That that somehow is, is binding and ties people up. Well, did you know that discipline also frees? Boundaries free you. When you know where the boundaries are, what happens? You don't get in danger, do you? Okay. If you have a fence built around your yard and on the other side of the fence there's a great big ledge that, goes, that drops 100 feet, why did the person, why did you put up a fence or why did anybody else put up a fence? To keep somebody from going over there. That's a boundary. A fence is a boundary. Okay. Why do we have seat belts in our cars? The fact is, I hope I never find out if mine work, okay? Or my airbag. Those are things to protect us, although, do you know what happens when an airbag comes out commonly? A person gets hurt from the airbag. And the seat belt, when a big impact comes, will bruise you all the way across your body. It hurts. It's a boundary but it's designed to save your life. And in the same way, discipline in the body of Christ is not designed to be hateful. It is just the opposite. There is no greater expression of love that someone can give to someone than by telling them and showing them and enforcing the Word of God in their life. 
there's no better expression or more loving expression than anybody can have. Because I want to tell you something, it's hard. When we first had children, we had our first child, and I was 25 years old when we had our first son. And I want to tell you something, it was hard to discipline that child. He's a good kid, still is. But I want to tell you something, it was always hard. As a first time dad, I knew he needed to be disciplined, but there would be times as an immature first time dad that I would think, well, that's funny. Well, it, it might have been funny, but it needed to be disciplined. And so I had to take on the dad role, and that wasn't too comfortable sometimes, you know. But he needed it, and all of our children did. I needed it when I was coming up. And I want to tell you something, there was not a day that ever went by in my life, and my parents, both my mom and my dad, disciplined me. They would spank me. But there was not one day that went by in my life that I ever doubted the love of my parents. Matter of fact, as I got older, I said, you know, y'all, I probably got by with a whole lot more than I needed to. And you probably need to whoop me more, you know. Well, why did they do that? They did not do it because it was enjoyable. They did not do it because they hated me. They did it because they loved me. And to this point in my life, I've not been in jail. I've lived a life out of respect for the law, both in the church and in communities, because discipline was administered. And I understood and I was made to understand the consequences of my behaviors. You do this, this is what will happen. And I knew that. And in our society, God has so put things in the laws of the land that when law is broken, there is humiliation. Now God will not be mistreated. That's one thing you can't get by with. You can't mistreat God. Even if you get by with it in this life, you will not in the next. So, what do we need to do? Those of us who are brethren, who love one another, who have a family relationship in Christ on this earth in local congregations, need to love one another enough to say, you know what, that's wrong. And here's the Bible passage that says it's wrong. And if you continue in this behavior and you will not repent of it, and you thumb your nose at the God of the universe, our Father, and at His Son, Jesus Christ, that died for all of us, and you crucify Him afresh every day that you live this way, and you will not change, out of love we are going to express discipline towards you and set you outside the flock. We're going to put you outside we're, so that you can think about, have your time out, and you can think about the consequences of your actions. You have evidently become very selfish and think that you can act like you want to. And you've got to know that God will not tolerate it. God holds the, His local congregations of the church accountable for how they treat this man in 1 Corinthians 5. What, read, read with me if you will. You glory in this and it's not good. Don't you know that a little leaven will leaven the whole lump? Anybody that cooks knows that you put rise, leaven or rise in flour to get your bread uh, or your cake to rise. Well, don't you know a little bit of that goes a long way? And so he says, you let a little sin go on in the church. In this case, it's not that little. But he says, just a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You let one person in the congregation get by with being a hypocrite? you got a whole congregation of hypocrites. You go invite somebody in the community to church, I'm not coming because they're hypocrites. you got to go, yeah, you're right. You see? So the Lord says, there's a way to clean house. And you clean your own house first before you go out and try to do anybody else's cleaning. And you make sure that you are maintaining the purity of the body of Christ. God's put that in our hands as His, as His people. And then he says, purge out the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. 
Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Be what you say you are, folks. And this fornicator being among you and you doing nothing about it is not sincerity and truth that you're walking in. I wrote unto you in an epistle, verse 9, not to company with a fornicator, and yet not altogether with the fornicators of the world. And here, is, here he's drawing a distinction between how we treat people in the world that may be guilty of the same sin and how we might treat a brother. There's a relationship difference. A brother in Christ claims to be bought by the blood of Christ. The fornicator in the world, he's the one you want to reach and baptize and get him out of sin. So you don't coddle him in his fornication. You tell him he's wrong. But at the same time, your behavior toward him is different socially. But with the one in the church, there's a whole lot of difference. Our relationship is different. We be brethren, okay? As Abraham said to Lot, he says, if you were trying to do the same behavior in the world with those who are fornicators or covetous or extortioners or idolaters, you would, have, you would have to go out of the world. You have to go to the moon or Mars or somewhere. So you're going to have fornication from the world and you expect that. But there is a higher standard that brethren are to walk toward. We are, we are held to a higher standard. We have said that we are the saved of God. That's a broad claim. That's a, certainly that's a, that's a tremendous claim. But to make that claim and then be just like everybody else, it's a travesty and makes a mockery of God and blasphemes God. And so he says, don't you do that. You get this straight. I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother, verse 11, is a fornicator or a covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner. Watch this. With such a one, know not to eat. Now the fellowship that we are to sever is first of all severed first by God. But the fellowship that we are to have with one another is spiritual fellowship. But there is an expression that is used here about not eating with someone. Now the way that lack of fellowship is to be shown with this person is that we will no longer socialize with them. We won't so much as eat with them. Eating at this time period was considered a tremendous act of hospitality. It was a gracious act, unselfish, one that people appreciated, and it was common throughout that area. It is today. Even among the Bedouin tribes that exist over in, England, in, in uh, Israel and over in the deserts of Arabia and Saudi Arabia, those uh, nomad tribes, if you come up to them and they deem you to not be a threat, they will invite you into their tent. They will bake you bread and they will give you water and they will try to make you as comfortable as you can. That is an expression of acceptance. We're not enemies, you see. But when one is an enemy of God, when one has walked contrary to the doctrine of Christ, he has severed his fellowship with God. Therefore, the recognition we are to have as brothers and sisters in Christ with that individual is that he is not one of us. He has not behaving. He is not behaving like he should. He is turned away. He is outside the camp so that he might learn to be ashamed. And I want to tell you something. There's a respect that comes in a church for authority when these things are practiced properly. If you know that if you don't do what God told you to do and you persist in it and will not repent, that that means that you will sever family relationships. That those, and you will do it, by the way. There's a tendency for people to think that they are doing something to someone when they withdraw fellowship from them for withdrawing fellowship from God, basically. You haven't done anything to them. You have done something for them. They have done something to you. They have severed the fellowship. 
they have said, I don't care what God says. And that has hurt you to the point that just like if you remember being a parent, your parents would say, this hurts me more than you. Well, the misbehavior of a child can hurt a parent deeply. And so it is with this child of God who says, I don't care what God says anymore. I'm going to practice this. I'm going to be married to my father's wife. And what are you going to do about it? He has thrust upon the church an action that they would not like to take toward him, but they have to. Because God says it's dangerous not to. All right. Do you remember that under the Old Testament times, that sin that was allowed to go on in the camp would permeate the whole camp? So that's why the death penalty in many cases was enforced. There was sin in the camp. And as a result of that, there was not blessing that came from God. Unchecked sin will always move toward pain. And so it is with the disobedient that will not come back. Don't let anyone tell you you have done something to them. Withdrawal is doing something for them, whether they appreciate it or whether they don't. Because they will most likely on a guilt trip, try to put you on a guilt trip to thinking that you have done something to them. Don't let them buy with that. They have done something to you. And first of all, to Christ. All right? Don't have any company with this man. If any man that is called a brother or a fornicator or covetous, with such a one do not even eat. For what have I to do to judge those that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within. There's responsibility that we have. God will judge those who are without and he will judge those within too. But he says in this matter, you have an obligation to render a judgment. You ever heard somebody say, you're judging me? Well, here's an instance where, yeah, it said, you judge me. We judge based upon your behavior. But in that sense, you're judging yourself. So someone has said, well, what is withdrawal of fellowship? Well, it's the church recognizing what the person has already proclaimed. I don't want to be in fellowship with God. So the church is recognizing, okay, he doesn't want to be in fellowship with God. Therefore, we can't be in fellowship with him and God at the same time. So we are severing our social uh, boundaries with him so that he might be ashamed and come back to us. We want him back at the table, but he's going to have to repent. Did you ever have a stubborn child, or maybe you were that stubborn child, who when disciplined, your mom and dad said, all you got to do is say, I'm sorry. And you just set your feet, or that child set their feet, said, I'm not going to do it. Well, okay, you'll just stay in your room then, or you'll stay in the corner. And all you had to do was humble yourself and say, I'm sorry, and really be that way. You know, there's a certain type of mentality that says, I'm going to press my point even though I know I don't have a point. Well, that's, that's stubborn. That's rebellion. And in some cases, you know, you can have the food. It's right here. But you can't eat and come sit at this table until you say you're sorry and mean it. Now, is a parent hating a child when they do that? No. In some cases, they're breaking that stubborn, satanic will that a child has, or, and in the case of brethren, that Satan has gotten a hold of them and has made them think they can act this way and still please God. And he says, there's no way you can do that. You've got to straighten up. And unless you're willing to straighten up, you will stand in the corner. You will be without the camp. And there will be no one to bring you food. And the relationship you had with your brethren where you were back and forth on a day by day, by, that, won't, that, will, that will change. Because you chose to do what you wanted to do instead of what God wanted you to do. Until you were willing to submit to God again, you'll stand in the corner. You'll be outside the camp. And a church that loves people will do that. And they will not feel guilty about it because it is what God has commanded. They'll not do it with joy. They'll not do it with being thrilled to death. The person is wayward. That will hurt them. It'll cut them. They will be destroyed in some cases by it in certain ways. 
but they will ramp up their prayer life for that person and they'll be so elated when that person does come back but again brethren have to act on what God has told them to do to not do so is to be a participant in sin yourself look at verse 13 those are without God judges therefore put away from among yourselves and how do, what does he refer to this man as? That wicked person. Here's a brother in Christ that's referred to as a wicked person. Why is he wicked? Isn't he bought by the blood of Christ? He's a child of God, yes. And as such, he walks to a higher standard. And we expect him, as his brethren, to walk to that standard just like he should expect us to do the same. Might he never really come back? That could happen. But on the day of judgment, the church will stand and those that have been responsible for dis disciplining him, making a difference, will stand before God without his blood spiritually being on their hands. Ezekiel 18 talks about correcting a soul that sins. When you speak to the sinner and you tell him of his ways, and he repents, know this, that you have gained your brother and you have saved them from a lot of sins. But if you warn your brother and he will not respond, know this, that God will require his soul from him. But you will not, be, there will, he will not require your soul from you because you warned him and he would not listen. Well, friends, that's where it is with us now. That's what the Lord's saying. The purpose, ideally, is for the person to humbly repent and come back. That happens. Sometimes it doesn't happen for years. Sometimes a person is so consumed with stubbornness and, and, and uh, arrogance and pride that it may take long after you die for the person to really think about what they've done. But I want to tell you something. Do you believe in God's plans? Do you believe His plans are perfect? I do. Do you believe that they will work? I do. I've seen it happen. I've seen people. By the way, this brother, this action was taken evidently. And in 2 Corinthians, the first few chapters, the brethren there are told to treat this brother with compassion. And not let him be overcome with overmuch sorrow. He's, he's committed a pretty big sin here, but he repents. And they're told to treat him with love in a different way now, to accept him, to practice hospitality with him, to be involved with social things with him, all right? So that has changed and he, should, he, and he seems to be elated that that's happened. Well, I'll tell you what, the right type of person will respond to proper discipline. And that's what we hope we all are. That we will do what God has told us to do when it comes to discipline. Again, when we walk wayward from God, we are walking unfaithful to Him. Again, remember here that this sin has gone on for a little bit. You don't let withdrawal be the first thing you do. You admonish, you try to bring the person where they need to be, you do not coddle them in their sin or excuse their sins. But when it's evident the person will not repent, you warn them. You make several attempts to work with them and to talk with them and if they will not respond, there's not much you can do except follow through on what God has said to do and not linger about it. You have to communicate to the person that, guess what, if you continue this way, we're going to have to practice what God has said because you're going to continue to rebel against God. And in rebelling against God, you'll be in rebellion to Christ Himself. You'll be in rebellion to His church. And we can't have that. You can't act that way. We're not going to do something to you. We're going to do something for you. All right? And generally speaking, what happens when this is done is the congregation is clearly informed that this brother is not or sister is not walking like they should. 
and an admonition to the brethren not to socialize with that person, a reminder of just what we've read today. Well, notice here that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, where it says, walk or uh, withdraw yourself from every brother who walks out of order, it goes on to say that do not count them as an enemy, but admonish them. Don't count them as an enemy, but admonish them. Encourage them to do right. You ready to come back yet? We sure do miss you. You know. So if you, if you're if you're watching tonight, by the way, and you are a wayward Christian, and maybe you're wayward from the Newton Church of Christ, I want to ask you something. Why don't you just give up your will and say enough of my will and not God's? I'm going to submit and I'm going to come home. I want to tell you something. The folks at the Newton Church of Christ would be thrilled to death for you to do that. And you would never find a greater welcome, welcome home, than would come from the church at Newton if you came home. Please do that if you're watching tonight. And if you are a wayward Christian in any way, and you have stubbornly insisted that your way is the right way, and you know that you are not the least bit pleased with the way you're living. You can't be comfortable in it. You know too much that's right. Then stop it. Repent and come home. Just like the prodigal did. Now after the prodigal repented, what, what, was, what was enjoined afterwards? Social fellowship, wasn't it? Kill the fatted calf. Rejoice. Let's be happy. The man has repented. He's come home. And things are back where they should be again. Well, notice here, these are some, there are some phrases that are used to describe withdrawal of fellowship. And it, they're unfortunate, just like what, hey, this happens an awful lot with people. Let's just look at some of them on the, on the charts, if you will. Somebody says, well, you know what? They just got kicked out of the church. Well, is that a true statement? Did the church kick them out? No. They kicked themselves out. They separated themselves from the fellowship of God. And then someone will say, well, how could you be so mean and mistreat people so this way? How could you do that? Well, obviously, if that was the reason that we withdrew from people, was to be mean and mistreat people, we'd be lost ourselves. But again, that's not the purpose. And then someone will say, well, you just need to love and show concern for them. And they'll come around eventually. Well, you know what? That's been the cry of a lot of sad parents. They'll come around eventually. And so they delay. The proverb writer says, discipline that is delayed is a joke. That's a paraphrase. But when you don't do what you should toward a child, you are not loving that child. You're abusing the child. So it is in the church. We're abusing one of our, our, our brethren when we do not exercise the proper discipline. And some seem to think that when someone is withdrawn from in the body of Christ, that we don't want them to come to church anymore. I don't know where that came from, but that certainly is not the case. You need to be at church. We want you to come to worship. Fact is, a lot of people withdraw, but withdrawn from for not coming and not enjoying worship together. So yes, come back. But know this, that if you've been disciplined for not coming to church services and you just walk through the door and act like things are going to take up like they've always been and that that somehow will be understood as your repentance, no. You have to humble yourself and say, I was wrong for the way I acted. I repent and I'll turn from that behavior. Well, someone may also come up with the statement, you're just mean and hateful. Well, if that's true, we're lost. If that's the motive behind discipline, absolutely. That's just wrong. That's sinful. But I'll tell you what, I've been involved in a lot of situations where brethren are trying to 
find out what they can do to help this person go to heaven. And the person isn't helping much. Who's the mean and the hateful person? Is the parent the mean, hateful person when they put the child in the corner and say, wait a minute, think about what you're doing? Or is that mean little child the one that's, that way, the one that's mean and hateful when they look at you and say, I hate you, you're awful, you're terrible? Who's mean and hateful? And the parent says, I love you. That's why I'm doing this. Well, all such charges that we have up here Pardon me, allergy season, and I apologize for that. It's a live TV, so sorry about that. All of these charges are based on a misunderstanding, friends, of what withdrawal of fellowship really is. Well, two main passages that we've already talked about. One of them is in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that we just read. And now let's turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. You have your Bibles? Still following along with us? Okay, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. By the way, I need to answer a question. Let's pause right here. Okay, you remember the questions we had a few weeks ago that I neglected last week? You remember we asked you who the oldest man in the Bible is? All right, now if you're watching, maybe some of our younger ones are watching, do you remember we asked who was the oldest man in the Bible? You remember who that was? His name was Methuselah. Then we ask, how old was he? He was 969 years old. And then we ask, what two men in the Bible never died like we do? What two men in the Bible were that way? They never saw death. You know who they are? Elijah and Enoch. Okay. Enoch was an ancient patriarch, and God just took him, it says. And Elijah was taken by the Lord into heaven in a chariot. Okay. So those are the answers to that question. Now, this is going to be a challenging question for the next couple of times. So this is your question. Research this. Get in your Bible and look it up. Okay. What three chapters in Genesis deal with the promise made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob? All right, and I'll tell you where to start. Genesis 12, this is a cheat. Kind of like if you're smarter than a fifth grader, you get a cheat, okay. All right, so this is the cheat. Genesis 12 is where Abraham was given the promise, all right. There are two more chapters. One chapter where Isaac is given the promise, and more, and it's repeated to him, and another where Jacob is given the promise. All right? Okay, so that's your, that's your research for next week. And then the second question is this. Who are the first set of twins mentioned in the scripture? The first set of twins mentioned in the scripture. Okay? All right. So let's get back to our program now. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians 3. Do you have your Bibles? Okay. So let's read together. He talks here about obedience to God. Okay? And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we see that there is an allegiance that we have to God. You know, our love for God and our service to God supersedes everything. All right, he says in verse chapter three, he says, finally, my brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and that ye may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. The Lord is faithful who will establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that ye both do and will do the things that we command you. Now we command you, verse six, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every, what? Brother that walks disorderly and not after the traditions that he has received of us. For ye yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. 
For we did not behave ourselves disorderly among you. All right. If any will not work, then neither let him eat. Verse 10. Verse 11, we hear that there are some who do walk among you disorderly. And notice how they are walking disorderly. They don't work, but they're busybodies. All right. Do not be weary in well-doing. Verse 14, if any man does not obey our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him. Notice this, that he may be ashamed. So particularly verses 6 and 14 is what we're looking at. And then verse 15, but do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. All right, you never give up on him. You want them to know that they're still welcome, but they have to submit to God. He says, you have an obligation. You cannot company with them. You can't give them mixed signals thinking that they're all right and that you're all right with them. You can't do that. And let me tell you, friends, from personal experience, that is one hard thing to do, particularly when you got family involved. But if you love them properly, and by the way, there's been situations in my own family where we have had to exercise discipline with family members. There are two of those three family members that I'm thinking about that have come back to the Lord and are faithfully serving Him now. And there's one that's still, still out on, on the sidelines. Does God's plan work? Yes. Whether or not that other one ever comes back or not, God's plan's not flawed. It works. But it takes faithful people to hold the line and to love these people even when they don't want to be loved. You know, you have to do that. You know, when uh, in society, and you'll see this on a lot of the TV programs, when you've got a child that is incorrigible and you can't do anything with them, they reach a point where you can't reason with them. You know what some of the treatments are for them? And even Dr. Phil <laughs> agrees with this. Take them out in the wilderness on a chuck wagon and let them learn how to live without a cell phone. Take away privileges from them. Let them learn to get their own water and, take, and heat it up and take their own bath. Let them learn that there are some blessings that they are not going to have as long as they are behaving the way they are. You know, they call that the breaking of the will. That's not the breaking of the person, that's the breaking of that selfish will. And notice, those are treatments that are valid even in today's warped psychological world. It works. You know why it works? It's the principle of God. All right. If you're going to behave this way, go right ahead. But you're going to do it without our sanctions. You're going to do it in spite of us, not because of us. 1 Corinthians 5, these people were doing that because the brethren would not continue, not act toward him. The brother was puffed up and the brethren were too. They were arrogant about it. Now when a change came and the brethren said no more, this brother was taken aback by that. Don't know how long it took him to change, but he did. You remember what it took for David to change? He lost a baby. He conspired to murder a man. He committed adultery. And he lied. And he persisted in it for over a year. And it was Nathan that came to him and loved him enough to do it. And said, I want to tell you a story about a man that had a pet uh, lamb. And his rich neighbor had some company over and sent to the man and had his pet lamb taken and sacrificed for the meal. David said, what an awful guy that was. That's a horrible man. He needs to be killed. And Nathan looks at him and he says, you're the man. You took your neighbor's wife. You sent him into battle and withdrew your forces from around him. And you, you might as well have stabbed him yourself with your own sword. David was humbled by that. 
You know, David as the king in that world would have had the right to say, I'm going to kill you, Nathan. But he didn't. And Nathan continued in his service faithful for some time. It was Nathan that saved David's life, not the 600 men. They spared his life. They had their part in it. But it was Nathan who was the one that had the courage to risk a friendship, to risk his life, and to risk reputation to help save the king. And he did. And David writes about it later on, that when he tried to keep his sins to himself, that it just ate him alive. And I want to tell you something, everybody that still has a conscience, that's what's going on. If you're listening tonight and watching tonight, and you're wayward in service, you are getting eaten up alive, and you know it, by what you know to do is right, and your resistance to it. You're not happy. You know too much about the truth to ever be pleased and happy in this world. So come home. Please come home to the Lord and to His brethren, and you will find a healthy welcome home that will await you. All right? Now, notice who's to be withdrawn from. The unfaithful are to be withdrawn from, not the faithful. Okay? But oftentimes, as it goes, the faithful are made to feel more guilty sometimes about their withdrawal than the guilty are about their sin. All right? Now, remember we talked about authority a few weeks ago? Christ has all authority, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. And we must abide by the authority of Christ Jesus. When Christ, through His Word, remember He's the one that sent the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit guided the apostles into all truth. And the writers of the Bible were guided as they were moved by the Spirit. So all the commands in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 5, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 2 John 9 through 11, Matthew chapter 18, all these passages tell us that there needs to be a difference made in a brother who sins and will not repent. A difference needs to be made in the way you treat them socially for the purpose of bringing them where they need to be. Now, the text that we have talked about in 1 Corinthians 5, notice the authority that is behind this passage. Paul invokes the authority of Jesus in verse chapter 5, 4, and 5. In the name of Christ, he says. That is not, he didn't just say, hey, Christ, or Christ. That's not the impact of the name of Christ. It's by the authority that Christ gives you. When you come together in my spirit with power, deliver this person to Satan. Notice in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6, same impact. We command you, brethren, in the name of Christ, or by the authority of Christ. All right, now, let's look again at some other passages. Why would we want to do things in the name of Christ? Because He is our authority. Now, when Christ tells us to do something, it is with His authority that that's done. Now, both Paul, in both these cases here, says that he is doing and t telling the people what they need to do by the authority of Jesus Christ. So, if we love Jesus, what will we do? Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. All right? Now, that's the main reason that we withdraw fellowship, because it's a command of God. The authority of Christ says you can do nothing else. All right? The goal of withdrawal should always be to restore the person back to fellowship. James 5, 19, Galatians 6 and verse 7, bring this person that is straight away back, help bear their burdens, those types of things. It's also to show love and concern, not hate and venom. Okay? It's designed, withdrawal is, to produce repentance. In 1 Corinthians 5, he says, deliver him to Satan. Uh, for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved. Notice that. This is being done that your spirit may be saved in the day of Christ. And you may not even understand that. The person that's being disciplined may not even understand all the details of that. But somebody loves you enough to say no to you. You can't act that way. 
And the Lord has ordained that it be his brothers and sisters in the church that say that to one another. So notice 2 Thessalonians 3, 14, 15, that he, be not that he may be ashamed. And then he goes on to say, admonish this man like a brother. All right? Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, remember we talked about this brother in 1 Corinthians 5 coming back? 2 Corinthians 2, you'll see he did. Now how did it work? How does discipline work? If the person is made to be ashamed. Now that's not done by having them to every social function you have and acting like nothing's wrong. All right, It causes him to think about his sin. When everybody else is enjoying one another's relationship to one another and he's not there, it causes him to think. He once enjoyed that relationship and he doesn't have it anymore. I wonder what happened. Are the brethren not willing to have fellowship with you anymore? Oh no, they're willing. But you have said no. I will not come to the feast. They will come to realize if they have a conscience that they are missing something and they are the reason they are. Remember here also that when we withdraw from someone we are to continually admonish them. We're to pray for them. We're to admonish them daily. Continually admonishing them. And the sad thing is, folks, that in the church we don't do that like we should. We don't let people know daily that they're missed. Or weekly. Or monthly. Or yearly in some cases. That's sad. Remember the reason for withdrawal is because we love people. You don't leave people alone that you love. And notice also another reason for withdrawal is to keep the church pure. Little leaven leavens the whole lump. If sin's not corrected, it will eat like a canker or a sore, and it will infect the whole group. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Remember we read that? Withdrawing fellowship also purifies the flock. There's a new lump put in there. Put away from yourselves the evil man. 1 Corinthians 5.13. All right. Now also, in Acts chapter 5 and verse 11, it causes others to fear. Whether or not the person ever comes back or not, the person is caused, the whole congregation is caused to fear. It makes everybody sit up and examine their own life. Will I be the next one withdrawn from? And it helps, other, helps all of us to say, you know, I need help and I'm not doing too well. I need to go talk to somebody and keep this from happening to me. Okay. So again, this is what the Bible teaches on withdrawal. Now, we have another question that has been brought up that people have oftentimes, and they say, well, you know, why doesn't the Church of Christ uh, have donkeys and camels and uh, manger scenes and all that at Christmas time? Why, why don't they do that? Well, it's because according to some people, it's because we don't like to celebrate. We don't enjoy being with our family. And we are just absolutely the most stick in the mud people that you'll ever find, and we try to find ways to irritate people. There'll be some people that'll tell you that. None of that's true. There's not a bit of truth in any one of those statements. So why don't we? Well, I think if you've been watching the program very long, you know. There's no authority for it. God does not authorize it. Somebody says, well, you know, what's the harm? Now remember, we're not talking about the family aspect of a holiday. We're talking about the religious aspect of it. Remember with the manger scene and the plays and the songs about the birth of Christ and the Christmas trees and the celebrations and the decorations in a religious way? We're not against having a party with fun and food, or with somebody decorating their house with a plant, or some decorations for that time. My wife actually changes the house around every season. I wonder where I live a lot of times. But anyway, that's nice what ladies do. Men would find that useless, but that's why women are there to help, help us have some culture. So, But the bottom line is we're not against those things. We're not against music. 
not against playing instrumental music. But remember we're talking, the question is, a religious observance of Christmas or Easter or any other holiday. All right? Did you, did you know that the Bible does not tell us, and you can search it again, search your Bible since you're going to be searching for those two chapters in Genesis. Search in your Bible through the prophets, through the Psalms, and through the law in the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament and see if you can find anything that tells us when Jesus was born. What day is Jesus' birthday? Biblically. We don't know, do we? We know it was during that time of Herod because Herod was trying to have him killed. But we don't know much more than that. We have a general idea. But we don't know the day, we don't know the hour, we don't know anything like that. The Bible just does not address it. Now, let me hasten to say the Bible does say, Luke chapter 2, that Jesus Christ was born. So we don't need to act like and run around and act like that Jesus Christ never was born. If you say he was, you're celebrating Christmas. <laughs> no, you, were, you are not. That's biblical. Christ was born. But we don't know the year. He was born between 7 B.C. and 4 B.C. That's all we know, because that would have been the reign of, of uh, where Herod was when Jesus Christ was in, uh, his parents took him from different places and ended up in Egypt, then he came back into Bethlehem, in Nazareth. Now, why don't we know the exact date? Well, remember B.C., you know what that stands for? Before Christ. There's a Latin term for that but I don't know it right now. Well, okay, so if he was born before Christ, would it be B.C.? <laughs> you know. Well, again, there's a problem with the calendar on that. So, someone wrote an article, and Haley's Bible Handbook deals with it on page 436. I'm going to read this to you. I'll just put it up here on the, on the screen for you. When Christ was born, time was reckoned in the Roman Empire from the founding of the city of Rome. That makes sense, doesn't it? When Christianity became the universal religion over what had been the Roman world, a monk named Dionysius Exegus, at the request of the Emperor Justinian, made a calendar, 526 A.D., reckoning time from the birth of Christ. To supersede the Roman calendar long after the Christian calendar had replaced the Roman calendar, it was found that Dionysius had made a mistake in placing the birth of Christ in the year 753 AUC, or that is from the founding of Rome. We say that Christ was born roughly about 4 BC, and that's merely because the maker of the Christian calendar made a mistake of four to five years in coordinating it with the Roman calendar when it re was replaced. All right. Somebody says we don't know the year, don't know the month, don't know the day. The Bible doesn't say anything about it. But honestly, the most likely was not December 25th. The season was probably not winter, okay? Because you wouldn't have been keeping your flocks in the winter. You'd been keeping them under shelter, not out in the field, okay? Somebody says, well, it doesn't get cold over the desert. Yes, it does. I've been there. And it gets cold out there, folks. Out in the open? Sure does. Well, Luke chapter 2, verse 8 is the only passage we have. Let's read it. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. All right, so what does that tell us? If they were out in the field and they were living out in the fields, it tells us that it was probably a little better climate at that time. Well, Let's look, the climate was mild, and to keep their flocks from straying, they spent the night with them. It's a fact that Jews sent out their flocks into the mountainous and desert regions during the summer months, and took them in in the latter part of October and the first of November when the cold weather started. While away in these deserts and mountain regions, it was proper that there be someone to attend to them. It's probable from this that our Savior was born before December the 25th that we call Christmas. At this time it is cold and especially in the high and mountainous regions around Bethlehem. But the exact time of Jesus' birth is unknown. There is no way to ascertain it. 
by different learned men. I have, it has been fixed at each month in the year. It is of consequence to know the time to some, but God would have preserved the record if it was important. Matters of moment are clearly revealed in the Scripture, and He has no regard for telling us the moment of our Savior's birth. Wycliffe says the exact date of Jesus' birth is unknown. The legendary date of December 25th cannot be traced back further than the 4th century. Adam Clark goes on and makes some other comments about this. By the way, uh, because this is not showing up too good on the monitors here in the station, I don't assume it is with you either. So if you would like this, you call in and we will send this to you, of course, as everything is sent free of charge. All right, and again, there are the Cyclopedia of Ecclesiastical Literature by McClinic and Strong makes other observations about the Christmas uh, time period uh, we know of today. But Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary says this, recent travelers tell us that at the end of December, after the rains, the flowers come again to bloom. The flocks again issue forth. The nature of the seasons in Palestine could hardly have been unknown to those who fixed upon the present Christmas period. The difficulty is more imaginary than real. And again, he says it's just a pure guess as to what day Jesus was born. Over the years, different dates have been established by people for when Jesus was born. Just like people have been trying to set dates for when the world ends, well, the game back then was when was Jesus born, okay? so. Uh, some said, well, d January the 6th when Jesus is born. Others said he was born on March 25th. Someone else says January the 10th. Someone else says May the 20th. December the 25th. And you could go on. Dates have been set for every month of the year as proposed dates that Jesus Christ was born. What does that tell us? We don't know. That's what it tells us. And the evidence is not strong enough to put it down and nail it down to one day at all. You think God in His wisdom knew what we would do if we knew exactly what day it was? We'd be celebrating a day that He didn't want celebrated. He was born. He came in the flesh. He was born of a virgin. It's a remarkable thing. But it is not the day that we are to remember. What are we to remember? The day He came forth from the grave. All right? We're supposed to remember his death. Now, what we know about the birth of Christ in Matthew 1.25 and Luke 2, 1 through 7, friends, that's about all we know right there. The visit of the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20 also. And then there's another passage in Luke 2, 21, when Jesus was circumcised. We know that he was circumcised on the eighth day according to the Jewish uh, tradition. Jesus' presentation 40 days after his birth at the temple. Also, we know of the visit of the wise men in Matthew 2, 1 through 12. And by the way, the time frame the Christmas story has about what happened, the wise men didn't come the same night. They came from afar, remember? We're not told there were three wise men. We're told that they brought three gifts, but that does not argue there were only three wise men. They came to the house not to the manger. So verse 11 of Luke chapter 2, or Matthew chapter 2. They, they, uh, Jesus and, and his parents journeyed to Egypt in Matthew 2, 13 through 15. All the male children were killed, Matthew chapter 2, 16 and following. And then Jesus comes back to Nazareth. Well, you know, all of that was because of prophecy and because of danger, certainly, but it was because the prophets had said it. And he would come from Nazareth. He would come from Egypt. Now, I tell you what, that whole scenario is interesting how that took place. God's working his plan around to keep up with prophecy. So how did December 25th become the birthday of Jesus Christ? How in the world did that happen if it's no, there's no Bible base for it? Well, it's not because the Bible says so. Remember that little song that kids used to sing? How do I know the Bible tells me so? Well, you don't know the date that Jesus Christ was born because the Bible doesn't tell you. There's no record at all in the Bible. 
Christmas was also, Catholic Encyclopedia says this, volume 3, page 724 says this, that Christmas was not among the earliest festivals of the church. Origen in 245 reputed the idea of keeping the birthday of Christ as if he were a king or a pharaoh. Clement of Alexander, about 200, mentioned several speculations on the birthday of Christ and condemned them as superstition. We do not know, in other words. Again, the Bible doesn't say. Now, are there some pagan backgrounds to the setting of the date? Yes, there are. The Christmas date of December 25th is, the, is, the, uh, is first met when, in the West in the 4th century and was then possibly borrowed from a pagan festival. International Standard Bible Encyclopedia teaches that. The Roman Saturnalia, which was the pagan f festival to honor Saturn, was a seven-day festival. It went from December 17th to the 24th. The 25th was a day of worship of the sun god Mothra. Celebration of victory of light over darkness is what it was. So again, there were all types of pagan backgrounds there, Catholic backgrounds to the setting of the date. Liberius, Bishop of Rome, changed the date from January 6th to December 25th in 354. Arrived at the day saying conception was March 25th, <laughs> and then added nine months. Well, how in the world do they know that Jesus was conceived on March 25th. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Okay, so, but when you start making up, making up things, there's no, no end to what type of lie you might come up with, all right? Well, again, there's all types of authorities that speak to this fact, and they all come up with the same conclusion. We don't know. We are not authorized to observe the day of Jesus' birth. No Bible authority to do it. No religious act to be done on the birthday of Jesus. Don't have a pageant, we don't have a celebration, we don't have some type of play. Don't do anything like that. No authority for the New Testament church to do that. We are forbidden to observe certain days as religious days. We are never forbidden of, of, of keeping a day as a day. All right, Romans 14, one person esteems a day, one person doesn't. The Lord says, fine, just don't put religious significance to it if God did not do that. All right? Now, we don't have the authority to go, come to church services only at Easter and only on Christmas. And we don't have authority to have some special pageant that day. You know, we preach on the resurrection of Christ every Sunday, talk about that. We talk about His death. We commemorate His death at the table. But in the whole course of things, we do understand the idea our Jesus was resurrected. He didn't stay in the ground, friend. He's a resurrected Christ. He's the Son of God. And He reigns in heaven right now over His kingdom. Now also, a Christmas program is entertainment, friends. Now the last question we're going to deal with tonight is a, is a question that is vital to your salvation of your soul. Why do we believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? A lot of people who are religious don't. All right? Why do you believe Jesus was raised from the dead? Have you ever thought why you believe that? Well, the Bible tells you. This belief that Jesus came forth is at the heart and core of everything we believe, friends. If Jesus was raised from the dead, then God exists. Jesus is His Son. The Word of God is true, and it is the hub of the gospel. If Jesus stayed in the ground, then He is nothing more than a Jew who died on the cross. It happened a lot in Rome. But because He came forth from the grave and was res resurrected, He came forth in victory. God is. God exists. 1 Corinthians 15 is where we'd find this. And notice, if you will, and we'll turn to 1 Corinthians 15, and I guess we need to put that on this chart, but we haven't done that. I did it, did it on my personal copy, but not yours. But 1 Corinthians 15 is what this chart represents. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul makes a dynamic argument about the resurrection. Let's just read some of it. Uh, chapter 15, verse 1, I declare unto you the gospel that I preached unto you, and you received it, and you stand in it, 
and you're saved if you keep in memory what I preached. I delivered unto you first of all that also that I received how that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. Notice that. 1 Corinthians 15 now, verse 4. He was buried and he arose the third day according to the scriptures. After that he was seen above of 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain to this present, but some are fallen asleep. So he ascended. People saw it. And then he was seen of James, and then of all the apostles, and last of all of me, who has one born out of due season. For I am the least of all the apostles, and am not meet to be called one, because I persecuted the church of God. But by grace I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not for nothing. Whether it were I or they, so we preach and so we believe. Then he launches into a discussion of the essentiality of believing in the resurrection. If Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how do some of you then say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ is not risen, your pre our preaching is empty and your faith is empty. And we're found to be liars of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise, if the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ is not raised, your faith is empty, and you're still in your sins. And they also that are fallen asleep have perished. Then he says, if we only have hope in this life, we're of all men most miserable. Now, let's look at that a moment. There are a lot of people today that don't believe that there is any such thing as a resurrection of the dead. Now, that's convenient. You can come back to me if you want to. It's convenient to say that there is no resurrection of the dead. Come back to me, please. All right. No resurrection of the dead. That certainly comforts a lot of people because there's no accountability, is there? Because when the Lord comes back, He'll judge the world. So if the dead don't rise, then when you die, you're just done. That's it. You know there's people that believe that. You know there's, somebody says, well, they're just godless people. Oh, no. No, no. We're going to talk to you about religious people that believe that. Do you know that 42% of preachers that leave seminaries do not believe in the resurrection of the dead? Does that alarm you like it alarms me? Now it alarms me that you can go four to six years or eight years in a seminary to school and come away more faithless than when you went in. They teach you that the resurrection, that resurrection of the dead is a theory, not a fact. Well, I don't even know why anybody goes to a seminary if they don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Paul says that this life is the only thing we have if there is no resurrection of the dead. Now, I've told some people, and I'm, I'm going to tell you watching tonight, if there is no resurrection of the dead, if we will not come forth from the grave on the day of judgment and give answer for the deeds done in the flesh on the judgment day, then I tell you what I'm doing, I'm going fishing. I'm done. And you should be too. But the resurrection, friends, makes all the difference in the world. All the difference in the world. Because Paul goes on to say that if there is no resurrection of the dead, we're all done. Our whole job that we've been doing, giving our life or, or putting ourselves on the line getting beaten, all that, we've been the most dumb people that ever lived. And all the sacrifices that you and I make, if there's no resurrection of the dead, if there is nothing but this life, Paul says we're miserable. The world says you're happy. It's the only way to be happy is if you realize there's no way to, you don't answer for anything you do. Comfortable idea, just not true. And it's just not found in the Bible, is it? But because Jesus was raised from the dead, we can be raised. He, he says here, 
in, in um, verse 16, if the dead do not rise, Christ is not raised. If Christ is not raised, your faith is vain. And he says, they that are fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Christ is risen, verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 15. He is risen from the dead and becomes the first fruits of those that slept. For since by man came death, by man comes the resurrection of the dead. As in Adam all would die with the consequences of sin, even so shall all be made alive. All right? When Christ comes back, he will have put down all rule and all authority. Now, friends, to those of you that believe in the in just side point, verse 4, 24, the end comes when he delivers up the kingdom, even the Father, then he, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power. Now, there are those today that believe in the rapture, tribulation, and Armageddon that come up and tell us when Christ comes back, he's going to establish a kingdom. Verse 24 says he's going to deliver up the kingdom to deliver up something, to present it to somebody is something that already exists. He's not going to establish it. He's going to deliver it up. So you see how man contradicts God there? All right. He must reign. What's he going to reign over? Verse 25, till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy is death. All right. He goes on, he says, do not be deceived. Evil corruption, communications corrupt good morals. Some will say, verse 35, how then shall the dead be raised up? And with what body shall they come? You fool, don't you know that that which you sow is not quickened except it dies? We got a lot of flowers coming out right now. Somebody planted those flowers. They got planted somehow. A bird, a worm, somebody took a seed and it took root in the ground. And do you know what happens to every seed when you put it in the ground? In order for it to bring forth fruit, it has to die. Now, that, that idea is lost to a world of kids that have no idea how to grow food. But don't you know, everybody that knows anything about it, know that that seed has to die in order for life to come. Well, he draws that parallel here. And you know that thou sowest what you sow, that the body shall be but bare grain, some of wheat and some of grain. But God gives it a body in the natural world as it pleases him, and to every seed he gives its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. There's one flesh of men and one flesh of beasts and another flesh of fishes and some of birds. They're celestial and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of one is not the glory of the other. There's one glory of the sun and another of the moon, and it's not the same glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in incorruption, or in corruption, raised in corruption. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown a natural, but raised a spiritual. There is a natural and there is a spiritual body. All right? So he goes on. He says, I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we all will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, this mortal immortality. So when this corruption puts on incorruption and this mortal immortality, then shall be brought to pass what is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? And grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through Christ Jesus. So therefore, brethren, be ye steadfast, immovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord, because you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So what have we found out about Jesus being raised from the dead? That it's really core to our belief in heaven and hell. And that we will have a body one day especially suited for eternal things. Have you ever wondered how you're going to enjoy 
singing praises to God forever? Our voices wear out, but they won't then. You ever wondered how you're going to enjoy the splendor of heaven? We'll have a special body, incorruptible body. We will be exalted. We will have a special body for that. Another reason we believe in the resurrection is because there was an empty tomb you've got to explain. What happened to that? What happened there? Well, if you I've been to that region and I've gone into some ancient tombs, do you know they were very small? Especially those for the rich. They were very small places. Very low, cut into the rock. And in Matthew 28 and verse 6, we find there that there was an empty tomb that somebody had to explain. Luke 24 verse 3. Everyone admitted that there was an empty tomb. The two men on the road to Emmaus and Luke, they're walking along talking. Jesus comes up to them. They don't know who he is. And he says, what's going on? They said, don't you know what's happened in Jerusalem? Everybody's talking about it. Are you the only man that does not know what happened? So there was an empty tomb. Where is he? Where is he? When they found out they were talking to him, they ran back into the city and said, we, he's, we, we just talked with Jesus. Well, the fact the tomb was empty has to be explained. How did it become empty? Remember that the Jews had secured a Roman guard to stand at it so that nothing would happen, so that they would not steal the body. All right? So how did, the, how did the tomb become empty? There was a rock rolled in front of it. And by the way, I've seen those types of rocks in over those tombs, and they are no light load, folks. Not a light load at all. Well, there are some, and there are, some of these are in seminaries teaching preachers. They get their seminary license, and they are ordained. But they believe in something called the swoon theory. What that says is, it's blasphemous, is that Jesus never did die on the cross. He just fainted. Well, the swoon theory is absolutely wrong because Jesus, remember when they pierced him with his side, out came blood and water? Well, what that indicates, scientists tell us and medical people will tell us, that when the body decays or starts to die, starts the process of death, one of the first actions is the separating of the plasma from the water in the blood. Well, that's what happened. And that's recorded. Now, in Mark 16 and verse 3, the women went to the tomb, and there was a stone there that they couldn't move. Remember, Jesus had been beaten almost to death. So if he just swooned or fainted, then you have to accept the idea that a man who had been beaten almost to the point of death and then nailed to a cross, that he was able somehow, with his hands, to escape that tomb and that he never did die. The blood loss Jesus had by itself was phenomenal to where he would have not had the energy to do that. Somebody says, well, he's the Son of God. Wait a minute. If he just swooned, he was not the Son of God because Isaiah 53 said he would die for us. Remember also, Jesus hadn't eaten in three days. So he'd be emaciated from that. The ones at the cross knew when he died. Nature itself rebelled at the Creator passing. Darkness was all over the place at a time that it shouldn't have been. So how did the tomb become empty? Well, the disciples stole his body. Well, isn't that the very reason the Roman guard was put there? So that the disciples would not steal his body? Matthew 28, 13 said that was the charge. How could they, without waking the guards, steal the body? By the way, remember I told you about the limited space in the tomb? The entrance to that tomb, it's not a big rock, but it's a heavy rock. But you would have to stoop, uh, stoop down to walk into it. And then you would have to drag the body out, or, or two men on each side, to get the body out. And remember, a dead body is not easy to carry. Okay? It's been three days. Different things are happening to the body. Well, 
How could they do this without waking the guards? If the disciples had the body, they would, wouldn't claim it. They didn't make a claim to it. Wouldn't they have made that claim? Now, the other was that the enemies of Christ stole it. Now, why would the enemies of Christ steal his body? Why would that happen? Remember, Jesus said, if you destroy this temple, I'll build it back in three days. He wasn't talking about the physical temple, but they thought he was. Now, if the enemies of Christ stole the body and produced it later on, they would have destroyed Christianity in its tracks. But they didn't do it. What motive would they have to steal the body, the enemies? All right. They wouldn't have any. Well, someone says, well, he never was resurrected. That's all just a story. All right. In Matthew 28, 7, the angel didn't conclude that. They said he is risen. Prophecy said he would be risen, Psalm 16 and verse 10. So, what about the change in the disciples? <coughs> did the disciples change after the resurrection? Yes, they did. When Jesus died, the disciples were absolutely depressed. They were in utter despair. Their hearts were troubled, John 14, verses 1 through 3. And shortly after the resurrection, they're changed. In Luke 24, verse 11, they weren't expecting the resurrection. In fact, they didn't believe it in the first, at, at first. And then they ran to the tomb to see what was happening. When Jesus died, the, the, Peter was an example of the despair they were under. Jesus had been denied by Peter. You remember that? Before he was resurrected. At the tomb, he was wondering what had happened, Luke 24, verse 12. And within a few days of when he realized that Jesus was no longer in the tomb, he was a different man. He spoke with boldness and he was ready to give his life. Acts 4 and verse 10, he proclaimed the resurrection and risked his life to do so. Remember how he, how he had denied Jesus three times? In Acts 4 verses 19 to 20, he says, I can't help but speak the things I've seen and heard. He wasn't the only one that said that. In Acts 5 verse 21, Peter is the one that speaks forth with boldness. We ought to obey God rather than men. So nothing but the resurrection could do that. And then let's look at the Apostle Paul for a moment. Let's go to the charts here and let's look at that. All right? The transformation of the disciples, the changes in the Jews. Paul would never have left what he did and what he was doing if the claims of Jesus to be raised from the dead were not true. He saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. Remember the Jews wanted to kill Christ? They said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. All right? The Jews wanted to kill Jesus, but in Acts chapter 2, what they heard about him coming forth from the grave in verses 24 through 36, Peter says in Psalm 16, 10, that's what's fulfilled right here before you. All right? And he showed that he could not be referring to David at all. Okay? Let's go to the charts, please. Concluded that Jesus is both Lord and Christ. So what they heard, they were changed. They were pricked in their hearts. They asked what to do. They were convinced of a bodily resurrection at that time. And then let's look at the witnesses. Why would they all lie? Do you realize, you realize what was happening here? They were honest. A, wit a witness to be reliable has to be honest has to have the ability to have remembered, has to have a number for um, there to be agreement. All of these are talked about in order for witnesses to be believable. And you had that. Let's look at what the Bible says. They suffered for the cause of Christ. All the witnesses did. Why would they do that if it was a lie? All right. Peter's denial in Matthew 26, the ambition Peter had. Why would he tell these things about himself? Why would these things be told? 
the witnesses were impeachable but on these things they were unimpeachable they could not be proven to be lying okay well as we go on through our through our study tonight and as we conclude we need to recognize that Jesus Christ and the witnesses that were there the number that they had had remember what it says in 1 Corinthians 15 over 500 claimed they saw him Peter saw him the women saw him all the apostles saw him Paul saw him so the witnesses are there the appearances of Jesus two different people appeared to the people on the road to, the road to Emmaus Thomas saw the, put his hands in the, in the uh, wounds the apostles established that the resurrection had occurred he appeared to many Mary Magdalene Mary Simon or Cephas the two men on the road to Emmaus, the eleven and five hundred at once, 1 Corinthians 15, 6, and then James. So, again, why would all of these people lie about a resurrection? Why would they do that? Well, because it actually happened, friends. They didn't lie. They told the truth. Okay? Well, we've got about two minutes, and we want to thank you for tuning in tonight. We've covered a lot of material. And we've had a lot of calls, and we thank you for that. We appreciate that. And we hope that if you've been watching tonight, that you'll come be with us at the Newton Church of Christ that meets at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. Go ahead and go back to the charts now, please. All right, we meet at 930 on Sunday morning, 11 o'clock for our worship period. And on Wednesdays, we meet at 7 o'clock. And this program is brought to you by and entirely by the Newton Church of Christ you can contact us by email at contact at wordandsword.com or by phone at 828-465-3009 or by mail at P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina, 28658. www.wordandsword.com is the website. Go to it and also leave questions. You can tune in again on May the 21st, 2019, as we continue in our study of God's Word together. And thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us tonight and being in our midst. All right, you can come back to me now. We want to thank you again for your time tonight. And again, if you have any Bible questions, any disagreements you have with anything we've taught tonight, you'd be our friend to let us know. May 21st, 8 o'clock. We'll be having our study once again on why we believe what we believe. If you're here watching tonight and you want to investigate the Bible further and learn what to do to go to heaven, we're ready to help you. Thank you again for being with us this evening. We bid you a good week.